just very quickly mention um, who is her. <laughs> so, uh, so she is a um, research affiliate at MIT Media Lab, Tangible Media Group. And she's also a PhD candidate in um, ATH, Royal Institute of Technology. And uh, uh, earlier this year, um, Oscar published a paper and the topic of the paper is highly relevant to the class. It's about, um, she will talk about more. My understanding is about um, linear, very miniaturized linear actuators that can be leveraged to create woven or knitted textile. And from there, she also introduced uh, a, a great uh, library of different morphing artifacts, especially the ones on body, but also off the body. I believe she also had some, some examples how those uh, morphing textiles can be used uh, for toys, tools, etc. So she's basically an expert in, in this field, in pneumatic, transformable structures, and also the underlying techniques, especially fluidic-driven uh, pneumatic actuators. Um, so it, it's, it's, as you guys can tell, it's highly, highly relevant to the subject of this week and last week. So I hope you guys can all learn a lot. It's a, personally, it's a great honor for me to be able to also host Oscar to give this talk. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lening. That was a very kind and elaborate introduction. Um, I will um, also introduce myself briefly, but I will, as soon as uh, possible, dive into my slides. Um, so hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, thanks for joining uh, this short lecture. And thanks to Lening and all the TAs for inviting me as a guest lecturer to this wonderful, inclusive, tangible and material interfaces course. It's a great pleasure to be here. My name is Özgün Kılıç Afşar and I'm almost midway through my PhD at KTH Soma Design Lab. Um, and as Lini said, I'm affiliated with uh, MIT Media Lab, Tangible Media Group, and also Microsystems uh, Engineering Group at the Uppsala University in Sweden. Um, today, I'll be presenting to you, uh, hopefully some inspiring work for the course, in a brief lecture titled Shaping and Being Shaped by Fabric Machines. My lecture builds on five main sections. I start with a conceptual grounding of my work and then briefly we'll talk about my combinatory approach uh, that I use for HCI research and provide three design exemplars that follow this research paradigm and it will be followed by the first tangible research result, which is the enabling fiber technology that Linning mentioned, um, and that will make the larger part of the seminar today. And towards the end, I will uh, talk about some sprinkle of current progress, uh, and then we will open for Q and A. Um, as you all are probably well aware of, for thousands of years, uh, humans have used fabrics in very much the same ways to provide basic protection, uh, warmth, aesthetics, or as an indicator of social class. So clothing represents one of the most ancient forms of human expression, which is finally undergoing a profound transformation today. And this transformation started to happen with the introduction of new complexities to the design of fibers and fabrics, such as fibers engineered to hear and sing, that shift color or have proprioceptive functions or fabrics with uh, storage and memory units. Often objects that serve uh, many complex functions are made of multiple materials, just as these uh, four instances of composite fabrics, whereas single material objects, such as a simple uh, drinking glass, usually has just a single and simple function. With the emergent textile technologies, some of which are being developed in stellar research labs like the Morphing Matter Lab, the single and simple yet fundamental functionality of fabric is changing. And this is thanks to the possibility to integrate many materials and complex structures into a fabric's very own fibers. So why morphing fabrics and why now? Um, one main overarching motivation of researchers in this effort, and mine as well, is to increase the value of fabrics to society 
transforming them from something that you buy, use and throw away to a platform for experiences and services such as tangible communication. The expectation of society from textiles uh, goes beyond the rate of its advancement, however. So these 10 year forecasts in smart textiles propose a breakthrough in textile technologies towards a sophisticated yet soft fabric computer that senses, stores, processes, and actively communicates information. So my research in this area of using fabrics as soft machines lies at the intersection of multiple paradigms in human computer interaction field. And these are movement-based interaction design, micromechanical transducers as in haptic sensor and actuators embedded into fibers and fabrics driven by microfluidics in order to construct radically morphing fabric interfaces. And all of this is done with an aim to build a closed loop feedback between the fabric interface and the body, where both can be prone to change and learn from one another. Uh, one research question that I started with is how these morphing interfaces can help us learn new gestures and movements through kinesthetic feedback from these fabrics with memory and artificially intelligent fabrics. For a moment, I'd like you to hypothesize a fabric ecosystem uh, on this dancer on the left, and uh, that will help her to dance like the famous American dancer Isadora Duncan, by first learning about her motor skills and then generating customized kinesthetic feedback to different parts of her body, like her feet or her upper body, to incrementally teach her Isadora's romantic dance culture. Or let's rethink in a less practical context and imagine a soft fabric machine that embodies our childhood self and through that enable us to access her and dance together with her. Another way to allow the past to feel its way into the future for these type of intergenerational interactions enabled by morphing fabrics could be an interactive corset that allows me to reconnect with my mom's singing body from back from when she performed as a soprano, where the fabric interface, as you see, is expressive enough to provide a direct haptic translation of her respiratory muscles, as well as the laryngeal muscle movements to be reenacted and replayed on my body for me to tangibly feel her voice, connect to her, like a sec through a second set of muscles that move on my own natural muscles. Practically speaking, this type of interactive corset can also be used. And in fact, this is one of the current case studies that we pursue at my lab uh, as an interactive technology that can render abstract concepts and metaphors that are used in vocal pedagogy, such as when the voice teacher, for example, tells the student to take soft spiraling breaths, which pretty much means nothing to a novice learner. And by embodying these abstract concepts in actuated fabrics, we could promote a rather concrete and accessible understanding of them for a novice learner. So throughout this journey that led me here, I found myself fascinated by the covered language that our bodies speak and how we can embody this language in a multimodal fabric interface in forms that can be felt, but also tangibly archived and transposed and shared with other bodies. And thus I began my exploration into how we would shape such a technology and how will this technology shape the ways in which we move in return. As Kamar et al. pointed out in one of the seminal papers in HCI called HCI Meets Material Science, the tools needed for shaped interface design needs to be more expressive, like the raw and versatile materials an industrial designer might use to create complex geometries. In the light of this vision, I will present you a body of work I've been invested in for the past year and a half called Omnifiber, which is an integrated fiber-based microfluidic material system. 
Omnified a response to this call, adapting and shaping emerging materials to empower interaction designers and the textiles community. By laying the foundation of a highly expressive and mechanically powerful material system, Omnifiber aims to open a channel towards interaction design with robotic fibers and fabrics, where we achieve sensing and actuation in a single package that can behave as a fiber in a fabric assembly. The primitive fiber design consists of a multi-layered architecture each layer with a diverse set of options. For example, the actuators can operate with compressed air or incompressible fluids like oil or functional fluids such as a liquid metal. The number and the length of the resistive sensor channels, or it could be also capacitive sensor channels that are applied on this elastomeric tubule can vary based on the, the application requirements or the elastomeric tubing itself can have different diameters, thicknesses, or different young modulus, all of which will affect the actuator performance. Now, I will move on to the effects of the, the outer mesh of, uh, on the actuation uh, behavior. Although our work uh, mainly focused on the effects of the braided outer mesh, uh, as in the number of filaments or the braiding angle, uh, as seen in, as seen in uh, figures A1 through A4, um, it is also possible to utilize tubular knitting directly onto the elastomeric tubing, um, as shown in figure B. However, one should keep in mind that an actuator with a tubular mesh will provide a smaller contraction ratio, which is about 15%, uh, based on our initial results, and therefore one will achieve lower strokes than that of a braided counterpart. Additionally, uh, yarns with different mechanical properties may be explored for this outer mesh, such as uh, in this video, you see a stainless steel monofilament that is made into a tubular braid, um, where we achieved 26% contraction, which is a bit lower than, for example, when we use nylon monofilaments. Um, at the same pressure of five bar of compressed air. There are uh, two basic motion primitives uh, that the morphing states, the further morphing states build upon, which is a contractible fiber, which is a thin McGibbon muscle, and an extensible one, which is a reverse uh, McGibbon muscle. The contractible fiber is um, able to contract 34% maximum and expand in diameter while the extensible can elongate up to 300% strain. And based on these primitives, we achieved a bending, coiling, multi-bending, out-of-plane bending, uh, uh, morphing states uh, by simply manipulating the braiding geometry. Um, as mentioned, omnifibers are customizable in size, form, or choice of materials and geometries, as well as being modular um, so that one can use different configurations of the fiber for their specific needs and use case. Um, for example, in this, uh, in this example, we have an array of six fiber um, sheet array uh, where we uh, can lift two kilograms of weight with 16.7% um, uh, of contraction ratio. Some further desirable functions of uh, our fiber brings into that we bring into active textile technologies is in its thinness. So the smallest fiber that we achieved is 500 microns, while the bending curvature and the surface properties allow easy machine knitability on a medium gauge industrial machine. Um, also, thicker fibers like 1.5 millimeters in diameter can be inlaid into fab, uh, rows of uh, knits, um, as you see in the, the video, and then they can be folded and knit in place to create these 3D spacer fabric-like structures where the uh, spacer layer is an active layer. Um, and in this case, the aim is to achieve out-of-plane forces as opposed to the lateral forces which can be mostly achieved with 2D actuated fabrics. 
Yet another benefit of uh, scaling the fibers to these higher hierarchical structures like a woven fabric is increasing the force output of the actuators. For example, an assistive technology requires uh, considerably high forces, tens or hundreds of newtons when you want to move a spine or a leg of, of a person, uh, or in order to support the movement of the limb. And this can be achieved through uh, weaving or braiding the fibers in order to improve the mechanical performance and force output. Or even one can operate the fibers in hydraulic mode, which uh, involves filling the tubing with liquids that are then driven by pneumatics. Due to the incompressibility of liquids, larger stresses will occur on the fiber body, which will in return provide larger and more precisely contra controllable contraction forces. Um, as you see in figure D, uh, we use a low melting point alloy, uh, in this case, gallium, that's injected in the silicone tubing. And then pneumatically, we drive the fluid to actuate the fabric sample. Uh, when kept in the actuated state at room temperature for roughly half an hour, the gallium went to a, a solid state and thus this allowed to lock the shape of the fabric. Uh, and this is thanks to the unique property of uh, fluidic actuation, which is called a catch state, where you don't need to provide additional energy to the system in order to keep it to, at its actuated state. You just uh, keep a closed valve state. When we compare to uh, its counterparts like thermally actuated fibers, it's much more energy efficient because in thermally actuated fibers, you need to continuously provide energy to, uh, to keep the system at the actuated state. So to summarize some of the important characteristics of omnifiber as an artificial muscle fiber system, these are high pressure microfluidic actuators, with strain tunability. They have high force outputs. Uh, for example, a one millimeter diameter fiber can lift up to a kilogram of weight. Uh, we achieved up to 300% strain with an extensible type fiber. They have fast response times and high frequency of actuation up to 50 Hertz. Uh, at which where the actuation feels like a soft vibration on the skin. And omnifibers, as you uh, as demonstrated, can be structured with traditional textile manufacturing techniques to form this mechanical swatch of higher hierarchical fabric structures. Um, so all of these are great, and high pressure fluidics has a dozen of advantages. Um, but what are some of the scrutinized parts of working with pneumatics and hydraulics? Of course, these are the noisy pumps or bulky control platforms and compressed air tanks um, that have been criticized due to discomfort or um, non-portability and therefore um, discomfort and wearability. For this, our system design also features a miniaturized control platform uh, named Flow.io, which has a valve manifold. So Flow.io platform uh, is invented at the Media Lab by my collaborator, Ali Shtarganov. And we have extended the Flow.io hardware and software to fit some of the requirements of our system. This is yielding high pressures up to currently 10 bars, um, which used to be just a bar or two before we started together and configured the system. Uh, we also brought in an auxiliary multi-channel sensor circuit to enable closed loop strain control. And as you see in this GUI, uh, the platform now allows for real time or planned task scheduling on the web GUI. So you can freely um, schedule a certain composition of a movement, uh, a peristaltic movement, for example, by assigning different actions to different ports. And lastly, um, we enabled communication between multiple devices for bi-directional interaction um, in remote contexts through web Bluetooth. So one of the latest implementations uh, is removing the miniature, miniaturized pump modules completely from the system and replacing them with, a, um, with an eight gram finger-sized uh, liquid carbon dioxide cartridge. 
A single cartridge of high pressure carbon dioxide allows the garment, um, a garment that is integrated with uh, 30 meters of a uh, 500 micron diameter fiber to run for um, up to an hour continuously due to the small volume of compressed air that's needed in the microfluidic channels. So this has rendered our system to be uh, completely portable and completely silent. Um, so for those that are interested in exploring this combined system, uh, I would also like to hereby welcome you to apply to our ACM Chi workshop on actuated materials and soft robotic strategies for HCI. Uh, the workshop focuses on making soft robotic prototyping and innovation accessible and inclusive uh, for researchers and non-researchers through a hands-on design process. And for further information, you can check out softroboticsio slash Chi22. So finally, to sum up this part of the work, um, at the end of uh, 2021, MIT News Office was kind enough to make a nice and articulative piece of video about our work. And um, I will uh, wrap up the Omnifiber part of my presentation by playing an excerpt uh, from this video. A team of researchers out of the MIT Media Lab, KTH Royal Institute of Technology, and Uppsala University have designed a soft robotic fiber that can sense its own physical deformation and mechanically respond to it. This smart fiber can bend, stretch, curl, and pulse on demand, even providing immediate feedback to the user. Similar to typical polyester yarn, this fiber can be woven into fabrics, turning an everyday piece of clothing into a kinetic garment that responds to different stimuli by the human body. This technology, the researchers say, could even be used in the medical field to monitor breathing and help patients regulate respiratory actions in post-recovery. I think it's really important to get our wearable technology to speak the language of our body. In that sense, soft robotic fibers, fabrics and garments make a great medium to work with, as they can be really expressive and very human-like in the type of feedback they provide. The fiber, they call omnifiber, consists of a hollow channel in the center, which allows the fluid medium to run through it, in this case, compressed air. The compressed air is controlled by a miniaturized wearable control platform called Flow I.O. It operates similarly to an electrical circuit, but instead of electricity, it programs air by controlling the pressure and flow rate. Surrounding the elastomeric hollow chamber are a series of layers, including a silicone-based ultra-stretchable sensor layer and a tubular braided polymer outer layer similar to a mesh. The design is so specific that by controlling the parameters of this outer interlocking mesh-like layer, one can mechanically program the motion of the fiber. Compared to existing pneumatic artificial muscles, our work combines multiple functionalities into a comprehensive system design, such as the fiber being sensor integrated, therefore having robotic functionalities or being as small as half a millimeter of diameter, which is kind of like a medium thick polyester yarn. And most importantly, being machine knitable to scale up to full body robotic garments. Currently, they have a working prototype of an upper body garment that has a kinesthetic or tangible approach to teaching people how to sing. Various parts of the garment control areas of the body, such as laces up the back that can pull the spine into the correct position, and fibers woven into other parts that expand and contract, guiding the user to breathe a certain way. Breathing has this invisible and intangible physiology, which I think makes it really interesting to work with. However, as breathing is a vital bodily function, we see this general purpose upper body garment being adopted for different use cases too, such as post-surgery or post-COVID breathing recovery and potentially for patients suffering from sleep apnea. Their next step is to make the fabrication pipeline completely automated and continuous to achieve longer strands of robotic fibers for industrial use. They are also experimenting with different fluid media for adding new functions, such as an on-demand stiffness change to the fiber. So finally, I will discuss um, some current progress on this work, and we can then slowly move on to the Q&A and discussion after this last bit. 
So as said in the Media Lab video, uh, MIT video, uh, the very first goal uh, with our project is scaling the continuous fiber fabrication by direct extrusion of the tubing with different properties and then overgrading with our custom built um, desktop grading machinery. This involves being able to uh, control the break parameters with such a precision that one can program the motion of a single fiber by controlling the braiding angle, the diameter, and so on. And this can vary across a large school of active fiber, which has various modes of actuation programmed in parts of it. Another uh, improvement planned towards the spring under a research collaboration with the knitting machine manufacturer uh, Shimaseki is building a design and simulation tool that uh, allows the addition of morphing elements onto the garments and their specific placement to output a machine knit code. So this requires, of course, a precise modeling of different actuators, mechanical behavior, simulate them on the UI, and provide design parameters to designers to work with um, for realizing their responsive fashion ideas for different use cases from sportswear, sleepwear, um, and to health wearables. And apart from these two technical progresses, we also have a work, in fact, an upcoming opera performance to take place at the end of this month that is based on uh, robotic wearables built with hybrid types of omnifibers. Unfortunately, um, not until a month uh, later, uh, I won't be able to disclose what the garments look like before the performance. However, I would like to speak just a little bit on the context of this work and in the interesting questions that it um, gave birth to. So this artistic performance is about transposing the bodily knowledge of an opera singer across to the audience's bodies as a new way of listening and appreciating music. And it's not just the reverberations of the voice, which we have seen a lot in sound shirts um, and many other applications, but this time it's really the kinesthetic expressions of voice, the muscle movements, and how it's embodied in the singer's body that is being transferred to the audience um, through this uh, garment. So this is an artist-led practice, built and composed in collaboration with uh, my close collaborator and classically trained opera singer, Kelsey Cotton. And in this project, uh, the project brought about the necessity to have the language or a notational system for fluidic morphing matter. And in this specific case, we were involved with translating voice or music sheet into uh, kinesthetic and vibrotactile notations embodied in the soft robotic fabrics with an intermediary machine translation from sheet music score to what we call haptic scores for each different patch uh, in the modular garment. So with this work, although the fabric itself at this point did not have a memory or a microcontroller embedded in it, we came a step closer to our vision of embedding tangible memories in fabrics and fabrication of artificially intelligent fabric IOs that can be programmed with machine learning algorithms to identify characteristic bodily activity patterns and also to uncover some of the hidden ones. With that end note, I hereby come to the end of my talk on fluidic morphing fabrics based on microfluidic artificial muscle fibers and the opportunities in pragmatic and artistic human computer interaction contexts. Um, I thank you very much for listening and now I'm happy uh, to take your questions. Thank you so much. It's a really inspiring talk. And uh, actually, it's fun to learn some of the um, visions behind the project from, uh, from me. So uh, any questions from our audience, I would love to give you guys opportunity to ask questions. Well, I'll start with one uh, if you have multiple. So you had one slide earlier um, talk about the human learning and machine learning and with the fabric in the middle. And I think the human learning aspect was clear. So there was a teaching aspect. What did you 
mean when you said machine learning in this sense? Yeah. So it's, um, yeah, I, of course, I didn't go into all of the details and it's a very uh, new concept. So I'll try to explain as much as possible. So the idea is to uh, be able to create this tangible database or haptic uh, database of um, the, the movement styles of a specific dancer or a database that is a result of uh, data gathered from multiple dancers, for example. And in this case, um, because the, the context was um, learning to dance like this specific dancer, it would pull uh, the information from Isadora Duncan database or dance style database. Uh, and that would be the type of movements that uh, the dancer would reach uh, as, as a goal. And um, so the idea of the customization is that the, the fabric also senses the movements of the dancer and therefore has an initial under, we have an initial understanding of where this person is starting from. Is this an expert who has a different dancing style already? Or is this a complete novice learner who will just start practicing basic movements? And of course, this is what I mean by the bi-directionality that the, the interface learns about the wearer, but also teaches back um, based on the, the requirements or based on the preferences of, of the wearer. That's exciting. So if my understanding is correct, basically um, body is, uh, is a reservoir to generate data, store data, yeah. but also it's, it's absorbing <laughs> the yes. knowledge. Um, so then here, fabric becomes a conduit to do that, both sensing and also output, right? Yes, so, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so there is a question. Uh, by the way, um, yeah, if you're shy, feel free to leave questions in the chat box. So yeah. um, Nona is asking, what is the potential application of muscle fabric that is mm -hmm. capable of lifting up to a kilo of weight? Beautiful work. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I will actually give a recent example that a, a student of mine has conducted um, using, using this uh, artificial muscle fiber system with the pneumatic control platform that was presented. Uh, she worked for a, a lower limb um, exoskeleton, but soft exoskeleton um, that is integrated um, into actually not a fully soft, a rigid and soft uh, combined exoskeleton where uh, the, the requirements of the device was to lift the lower limb, uh, the, the leg of the dancer, um, in this case specifically tap dancers, uh, in order to interrupt or like bring in, you know, new gestures to their dance style. So she did this study with um, um, four dancers in total, which uh, was super interesting in itself, but one of the requirements of that work was to use an array of these thin muscles in order to achieve the forces that are required to move a human limb. For example, if we think about um, compression, compressive forces, let's say I want to give you a virtual hug. A strong virtual hug <laughs> corresponds to around um, 200 newtons of force, compressive forces required on the body. And this is where the, the when we discussed the, the stresses um, and, and the force output of the actuators, this becomes really important when we want to communicate haptic, um, both in tactile and kinesthetic terms. Um, so this is where lift, the capability of lifting a kilogram of weight with a thin actuator becomes really fundamental because we can both integrate it into fabrics, but also still um, achieve uh, high enough forces to use it in human contexts. Um, and thank you so much for the nice comment as well, Nonna. Um, I'll go through the chat leaning. <laughs> yeah. If, if... Go ahead. Uh, so the motivation of integrating actuation at a yarn level as opposed to more, more to the sheet level, um, it, it comes from the potential of uh, fabrics, textile technologies. And with, with that, the different type of geometries and the different type of mechanical behavior, this 
uh, the, uh, the capability of achieving with a line, structuring a line, uh, similar to some of the work that was done in Morphin Matter, like a line, which was uh, really inspiring to this, to use the, the simplest unit of a line or a thread to build these more complex structures where we are not constrained with what a sheet actuator can do, but really, um, uh, really push the boundaries of, of the geometries with which we can create visual and haptic uh, feedback with. Um, the fabric system respond to increased body heat. Uh, that's a great question. So um, up, to, up to 126 degrees, um, the whole system is safe, is not affected by any temperature. There is temperature buildup due to high pressure, uh, uh, high compression of the air inside the microfluidic channels, but we have not observed any effect of this temperature change in the, in the actuator's performance so far. Um, and the surrounding temperature, um, as long as it's a temperature that the human can survive in, it won't be, it won't cause any, any performance issues or change in the behavior of the actuators. Um, but one, one comment there is if you were to use liquid metal as a sensing element, for example, that would be highly affected by the change in temperature. And then we would be um, discussing a, a different topic. But in, in the form of the paper that we presented, we use carbon black based um, silicone uh, sensor channels, which uh, are not affected by temperature. I, I want to ask the very last question, um, mm -hmm. maybe the very last, I, we also need to let you go. Um, I know uh, it's a little bit over time. So for the students, actually, if, um, if they are interested in, obviously, you use some of the highly customized technique for some more uh, fine tunability. So if they want to just get started with a class project, right, what would be the easiest way to do so? Um, I, I try to, like, we try to write the paper in a form that is uh, accessible enough to replicate the, the um, both the sensor and the actuator uh, co-located design. Um, there, most of the resources are in the paper from where you can buy off the shelf materials, which I think was uh, the biggest advantage for me to start with this project so fast until I started to customize, which is very recent. Um, so a lot of these parts can be found off the shelf. Um, and I also shared some of the 3D printed files for these modular pneumatic connectors. Um, as long as you have access to a, um, uh, you know, a, a workspace, a 3D printer, a, a fab lab, uh, so to speak, and I'm sure you do have amazing machines there. Um, it's a matter of uh, ordering some of the right materials and making leak uh, proof um, actuator designs, but they, you know, they're also very much welcome to reach out to me um, if I can help in any way, um, if things are not clear on the paper as well. Um, I have been collaborating with several people, people over distance and sending out some actuators, um, so I'm happy to do that as well. Um, same goes for the pneumatic control platform. All of this information is disclosed for how to build that from scratch on softrobotics.io, uh, which belongs to my uh, collaborator, Ali Stardanov. Um, I hope that is an answer to your question leaning and the great questions, everyone. Thank you so much. And thank you for hosting me um, in, in this wonderful course. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, and you guys saw the, there, there's this Kai workshop um, Osgan and the other collaborators are organizing. And I believe it's hybrid as well. <laughs> so if you guys are interested. Yeah. In that, Yes, it is hybrid. I will hopefully be there physically, personally, unless Kai goes all hybrid, but we prepared our, sorry, all virtual, but we prepared ourselves for that. So we will be sending out some kits um, for hands-on exploration. Amazing. Uh, let's give the last round of applause to Adam, our great like, guest lecturer of the day, super inspiring. 
I hope I get a chance to um, chat with you more. There are many exciting ideas. Um, I clearly see this is beyond just um, rehab and right healthcare. It, it's it's about augmentation. If folks mm -hmm. remember earlier, we talked about mm, human 2.0 from Professor Hugh Herr. So this is a really good demonstration of that. Also has a very, very strong inclusive flavor that's very mm -hmm. related to our course as well. Great to have you. Amazing. Thank you, Leaning. And yeah, looking forward to keep in touch with, uh, with you and everyone else. Yeah, take care. Thank you.